70 in line up right now. One after another, line the street next to Village Presbyterian Church in North Tampa to grab a month's worth of nutritious meals in a time of need. I am very indeed blessed to be able to have a place like this to come to. Just make some different items, please. A cake and a bag of rolls. The kids like waffles? Monica Wilson orchestrates an assembly line operation every Sunday and Wednesday at the Community <laughs> Food Pantry. A more meticulous approach now since the number of families the pantry serves Guys have two families here. ballooned from 50 to 2,000. We're serving three to four times the amount of people. Now, when you think about what's happening with inflation, that has hit our families much, much harder. Tampa Bay outpaces the entire United States in inflation. The Bay Area is in the midst of an inflation rate more than 10%, a high not seen in 40 years. It usually just spikes. It's not like a continued month after month after month of, you know, 7-8%. That, that's, that's unusual. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, overall inflation in the Bay Area hit 8% in November, and it's climbed its way up ever since. Mike Snipes, a professor of economics at the University of South Florida, says it's due to increasing demand in the face of unstable national markets. Part of the reason why we might be seeing these the kind of these disproportionate increases in food could be that you know, we're, we're still in a state of uncertainty. The Consumer Price Index for March shows food rose nearly 9% in price from March 2021, and groceries hit a 10% hike. Families that were kind of just getting back on their feet are now back on their heels. Thomas Mance is here to help Bay Area families regain their footing. A vow he took nine years ago as the leader for Feeding Tampa Bay, but the mission to end hunger only grows more challenging by the day. You know someone who is food insecure today in your life. You just don't happen to know that they are. Mance says one out of every six people in Tampa Bay are starving. And his team's goal to shrink that number is stifled by inflation. It's not only what happens inside the homes of those we support, but for organizations like Feeding Tampa Bay, our ability to do as much as we want to do, it's more difficult when we have higher operating expenses. Feeding Tampa Bay drives nearly 70 delivery trucks in 10 Florida counties every day. With the cost of diesel on the rise in recent months, man says the price of fuel and food is adding up. The cost of doing business for us has risen dramatically. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Keep the smile. I love it. But Mance remains positive and relies on the help of partners around Tampa. Thank you. I'm going to allow you guys to just kind of really try to gauge what's going on at your, each of your yes, stations. Two extra long breaths. It's conversation after conversation that we have with real people who are in our community that are working and trying to make it and they just can't make ends meet. You know Soaring prices are forcing many to turn to food banks for help, but inflation is also making it harder for food pantries to stay fully stocked. A farm share food distribution event was held at a church in Sandalwood this morning. News Jackson reporter Corley Peel explains how inflation is impacting food banks across the country. A truck filled with groceries was a sigh of relief for the Franquez family Saturday morning. I'm a lung transplant patient and my medical bills are through the roof. Um, I, my paycheck is literally, a whole paycheck just goes to health insurance. You've heard of working poor, that's us. We're both working for a living, we're still struggling and trying to get by. It's hard nowadays, the times are tough and this helps us and helps a lot of people out there. Farm Share hosted a food distribution event at the Truth Church in Sandalwood. Families aren't the only ones struggling with inflation rates soaring. According to Feeding America, food banks across the country are buying nearly as much food as they did last year, but are paying 40% more for that food. In the Labor Department's most recent consumer price index, the price of food at grocery stores in March was 10% higher than March of 2021, and the price for food in restaurants was nearly 7% higher. Times are tough. Uh, prices of groceries have gone way up. Rita Franquez says she's not sure what her family would do without farm share. We were in the red all the time, and now we're, we're finally being able to at least get a little savings out of this. Their family says they can breathe easier knowing they have more food to put on the table. Corley Peel, Channel 4. Blanca Lopez comes to this fair three times a week to sell some of her clothes to get cash. She lost her job during the pandemic and comes here with her disabled daughter because it is the only chance she has to make a living. 
I was working cleaning houses and during the pandemic I lost my job. My daughter is receiving some government assistance and with that and the old clothes I sell, we try to survive. People in Argentina are struggling with one of the highest inflation rates in the world, about 6% a month. Many who come here lost their jobs in the past years. People come here to sell some food and clothes, among other things, but also to participate in a lottery where they come and they put some food in this bag that you can see here, some pasta lentils, and then they write their names in this little bag. The name that comes out is the winner, and that person takes all this food back home. But food is not the only thing that's being raffled. Oscar Loyarte sells tickets for a few cents each. The money he collects is also offered as a lottery prize. He says increasing numbers of people are coming here to try to win extra money. People are coming here because of the economic situation. People tell us they cannot find a job and this is what they have. We are adding extra days so they can come sell something. This is the only way they have to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. The biggest price is around three dollars. The second is two dollars and the third just one. It's a lottery for the poor, who now account for more than 40% of Argentina's population. Rocio Lizarraga was happy with the money she won, even though it will only last for a day. Everyone is struggling. My husband has a job, my mom cleans houses, and they get their old clothes and I bring those clothes here. I have a four-year-old daughter, so I cannot work because I can't afford daycare. Argentina's government spends millions on projects to assist the poor. But people like Eduardo Donza say it's not enough. With an inflation rate of around 5 or 6 percent, most of the cash transfers made by the state lose value. Argentina has a strong state presence. Around 30 percent of the population already receives assistance aside from the pensions. Argentina is trying to jumpstart the economy and generate quality jobs. But it has not been easy. Fairs like this one have become a crucial lifeline for many. My name is Irshad Ahmed Awan, and I'm running my tuck shop from the last six months. Five years ago, I started my work on a cart and was selling snacks. I am very worried about the continuous increase of prices, as all my livelihood depends on edible oil and gas, and the prices of both has increased and now out of reach. We used to buy oil at 120 rupees per kilo during the Nawaz Sharif government, and during the government of Imran Khan, prices have gone up tremendously. If you do the comparison with today's prices, it's 300 percent more. The poor can't even afford a piece of bread these days. May Allah save this country, as by the looks, we are about to go bankrupt. Look at the dollar rate. Look at the price of oil and ghee. It's on the rise every day. Both government, the previous and present, are unable to control the price hike. The price of petrol has been increased by 30 rupees per liter in the last week, and now we're hearing that it's going to go up to one dollar per liter, which will make our lives worsen. Everything is so expensive, and I'm worried how to bear the expenses. I am paying 150 US dollars rent for the house, and 130 US dollars for my tuck shop, and it's hard to earn even that. We are three people working at this shop and can't even earn the basic expenses. I can't even dream to buy something good for my children. I brought them to work with me to minimize the expenses so that I shouldn't close my businesses to have a piece of bread at least. I wish and pray if any government comes, if they should look for the benefits of poor like us and should control inflation. Helping put food on the table. Community kitchens like this are starting up around Sri Lanka as people struggle with its worst economic crisis in more than 70 years. Food inflation has hit nearly 60 percent and many people are finding it difficult to cope. Most of these community who are coming today or been coming are surviving with two meals. So we are giving them the responsibility of surviving for one meal and we are saying, right, we will support you with one meal, but a good healthy meal. Few now get to eat this well. It's very difficult. We rarely get food like this. Only my husband is working, but what he earns for a day is not enough to feed the three of us now. 
tax cuts three years ago slashed government revenue by more than $2 billion. The tourism industry was then damaged by the Easter bombings and the pandemic. Now there is no money to import fuel, medicine, cooking gas or food. Right now actually our main focuses are on food banks, on community kitchens and again long to medium term uh, community gardens and home gardens because we can give rations but it's very short term. The government is appealing for help. We urgently require the assistance of our friends in the international community to ensure that our immediate needs in terms of the importation of essential medicines, food supply and fuel army. India and China have sent food and medicine in recent days. The opposition says the government has weakened the economy through populist policies and mismanagement. A nationwide campaign dubbed Gota Go Home has been running for two months, calling on the president to resign. The government is seeking a loan package from the International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Critics say it'll take too long, even if agreed, and people need action now. Tens of thousands of Sri Lankans are going hungry amid the country's worst economic crisis in decades. Community kitchens like this can only feed a fraction of them. Running a business in Zimbabwe is tough. The constant uncertainty over the volatile Zimbabwean dollar doesn't help. To make matters worse, banks were recently ordered to stop lending with immediate effect. The central bank's temporary freeze on loans aimed to contain inflation and stabilize the economy. Entrepreneurs such as Wanda Manozo panicked. His business supplies mining parts. If I can get an order from the mine, it will be too big for me to, to, to handle myself. So I go to the bank and get this, what you call soft loan. I do the service, I do the job, I repay back my loan so that I will keep my business going. But when we heard the news, it, to, it, to us it was a, a, a big disaster because um, we can't do without the banks. A few days later, the decision to stop lending was reversed and things went back to normal. But some economists say the damage was already done and dealt another blow to Zimbabwe's image internationally. Do you expect more of this uh, towards uh, as they run up the elections? So anyone who is thinking of Zimbabwe to lend money, we have to think twice. So we remain excluded in the global financial system as a country until after the elections of 2023 in July. Zimbabweans struggling to cope with hyperinflation are used to sudden announcements from the central bank. They know whenever there is a change in economic policy or banking rules, they can expect more hard times. Many people here don't have faith in the Zimbabwean dollar because of its rapid devaluation. They prefer American dollars, either to hold on to a security or spend on business transactions. But inflation keeps rising and that's led to a big increase in prices of basic goods. To help consumers cope with the high cost of living, the government is allowing people to import goods such as cooking oil and sugar tax-free. But that's expected to affect the local manufacturing industry and lead to more job losses. The COVID-19 pandemic and the war in Ukraine is hurting economies worldwide. But maybe in Zimbabwe's case, policy inconsistencies could also be to blame. Harumatasa, Al Jazeera, Harare. It's normal for the cost of goods and services to rise steadily over time. Most economists think it's healthy to have inflation rates at around 2%. But many countries are reporting major increases in the price of food, housing and fuel. It's been called a cost of living crisis. In European countries using the euro, inflation rose to a record 8.1%. Inflation in Britain is at a 40-year high. To help families pay soaring supermarket and energy bills there, the government's announced a $19 billion package. High living costs were major election issues recently in Australia, Colombia and France. The crisis is being blamed on shortages of workers and supply chain backlogs from the pandemic. Also being blamed is Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has increased prices for petrol, natural gas and staples such as wheat and cooking oil. Oil's gone up, petrol's gone up, diesel's gone up. It all adds on to everything. And Joe Public's paying for it. We're all paying for it. And how much more can we pay for? I definitely have felt the crunch past two months. And yeah, it's not nice. <laughs> it's not. I've had to get a second job. Actually looking for a third job also. The main issue at the moment everyone's facing is the cost of living. 
to be honest. As a as a middle income earner, I would say that you know bringing up your children, sending them to the school, and the expenses that you are facing at the moment, and the cost of living that's going up. The impact is being felt hardest in the world's poorest communities. The charity Action Aid found some families are spending nearly four times what they were paying before Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Action Aid looked at average prices in 13 countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. It found the average cost of bread and pasta rose 50%. Petrol is 63% more expensive. Fertilizer, 83%. In the Horn of Africa, where 20 million people are going hungry, some are paying double or triple the price for bread and cooking oil. Things are tough. We are not seeing any improvement. And things have got worse when the price of fuel went up. What used to be $5 a while ago is now $14. They should reduce the price of fuel. My entire paycheck won't even be enough to buy my family five bags of bread. My retirement pay can't get me five bread bags. Where have we reached? The cost of almost everything, from food to fertilizers, is soaring, causing consumers to spend less. As governments aim to bring down the cost of living, containing inflation without pushing economies into a slowdown is difficult. And that's all while Russia's war in Ukraine and pandemic disruptions continue to constrain supply chains, darkening the outlook for the months ahead. So should we be ready for a global recession? Well, the head of the World Bank has warned that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could cause a global recession. David Malpass told an event hosted by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that Germany's economy, the world's fourth largest, has already slowed significantly, while the U.S. and China are also seeing slower growth. He added a fertilizer shortage could worsen economic conditions elsewhere. The World Bank has already cut its global growth forecast for this year by nearly a full percentage point to 3.2 percent from 4.1 percent. Well, the International Monetary Fund has also declined to rule out a global recession, but it says the world economy still has a cushion against contraction. There are many headwinds to the global economy. The war could escalate. You could have sanctions and counter sanctions. We have central bankers around the world tightening monetary policy. Financial conditions could tighten much more rapidly than we've already seen. And growth in China is slowing. So all of these pose downside risks to our forecast. So again, globally, I would say at 3.6%, there is a buffer. At the same time, there are countries that are getting hit hard, I mean, countries in Europe that are getting hit hard by the war, where we could certainly see technical recessions. Now let's have a look at some of the recession factors cited by financial institutions. The MSCI World Stock Index fell more than 18% since a peak in early January. And there's been a sell-off in bonds, industrial metals, gold and crypto assets. China's GDP growth has slowed because of strict COVID-19 lockdowns. The country's retail sales fell 11% year-on-year in April, while industrial production was down 3% and unemployment is rising. The US is increasing interest rates and tightening its monetary policy to slow economic growth and bring inflation down. Meanwhile, Europe's households are suffering a cost-of-living crisis as prices rise much faster than incomes, limiting spending and the recovery from the pandemic. And the situation could be worse in many developing markets where fears of a food crisis are mounting. And even though the numbers are better than expected, fears of an economic recession remain. The Federal Reserve is attempting to bring down inflation, but is the effort to provide Americans with real relief enough? Sultan Magji is the former chief innovation officer for the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and currently a professor at Duke University. He joins me now. Thanks for being with us. Uh, so the Fed is raising the interest rate to avoid a recession. Will that work or are we headed for a recession? I think that's what everyone wants to know. 
Well, I think I want to know that too. Uh, the fact is, is the Fed is uh, playing kind of a dangerous game right now. They've got to slow the economy down and, and kind of cool things off a little bit to get inflation under control. But in doing so, there's a real opportunity that they're going to overcorrect and slow the economy down too much. You know, the vast majority of businesses in the United States have benefited from the Federal Reserve playing a more active role for the last few years and in some ways printing money and using that to buy things. So constantly feeding more money into the economy. And now the Fed has tapped the brakes pretty hard and they're going to be doing it for a while. You know, the rates are going to they're going to continue to have these, you know, 50 basis point, you know, increases for a while. And there's a lot of concern that once rates get over, let's say, three and a half percent, that it could tip us into a recession pretty quickly. Nick, tell me where you stand on the markets right now. You're one of the great market watchers out there. Uh, out, those of you who don't know, uh, Data Trek puts out an outstanding um, daily newsletter. You're, you're sort of a you're not a quant trader, but you're, you use quants, yeah. quantitative analysis for the stock market. You, you analyze massive sets of databases yeah. and, and look for clues. You mine for clues. Um, what do you see happening in the markets right now? The big question is, are we going to avoid a recession or, or, or not? Okay. Yeah, so the short answer is we're in for some more trouble. Uh, we've got two problems. The first is oil prices seem to still want to go higher. At 140, they're a double year over year. That's the signal of a recession coming. It always happens. When oil doubles in a year, you get a recession in the next 12 months. So that's a thing to worry about. My other concern is earnings expectations are way too high for the back half of the year. We've been doing $54 a share in S&P EPS every quarter for the last four quarters. The street's at 60 and $61 a share in the back half of the year. Those numbers have to come down. They're just irrationally high. And the market understands all that. The market's discounting those already. But until we see earnings cuts and continued growth and oil prices come in, I think we're in for more trouble. I honestly don't understand this. I've been watching the markets for 25 years as the stocks correspondent, and I am amazed they have not taken the earnings estimates down this year appreciably. So more than 100 days into the war in Ukraine, and the fighting is intensifying in the east. Far from the front lines, the conflict impacting the global food supply especially in Africa, which imports 40 percent of its grain from Russia and Ukraine. The chair of the African Union traveling to Sochi to help get deliveries back on track. I spoke to the European Council and I told them, yes, there is a war, the crisis, but there's also sanctions. We should work together on resolving these two problems and make sure that everything concerning food and grain supplies is outside the sanctions. His meeting, President Putin ended with a promise to ease the export of grain from Russian-controlled ports. Putin blaming the West for using Moscow as a scapegoat. Of course, now we see an attempt to shift responsibility for the global food crisis to Russia. This attempt, as our people like to say, is an attempt to shift from a sick head to a healthy one. Food prices have shot up across Africa since Russia invaded Ukraine with fears of famine and the U.N. warning of mass migration if food doesn't reach African shores fast. Russia has played a hunger game uh, recently to put blame uh, on Ukraine and others for blocking Ukrainian food experts. Uh, so basically they are saying that uh, the imminent hunger in Africa and elsewhere will become soon because of the Western sanctions on, on Russia, not because of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and blocking of Ukrainian ports. But despite today's pledge, it remains unclear when those ports will be able to release the supplies Africa and the world so desperately needs. Russian soldiers pick their way through the rubble of what used to be an apartment block in Severodonetsk. Russia was in control of more than 70 percent of this small industrial city in the east of the country. But in recent days, Ukraine's military says it's reclaimed some of the territory and accuses Russia of blowing up bridges to prevent them bringing in reinforcements and aid. In the Donetsk direction, the enemy is shelling positions of our troops along the entire line of contact with mortars, cannon and rocket artillery. It uses operational, tactical and army aviation. The main efforts are concentrated on the Siviero, Donetsk and Bakhmut directions. Fighting continues in the city. In Donetsk, Russian shelling sparked a major fire at a famous wooden monastery. It's one of Ukraine's most sacred Orthodox sites. 
It caught fire as a result of a Russian artillery attack. This was not the first attack. On Wednesday, three monks were killed by Russian shelling. In Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, a civilian airfield has been damaged by a missile strike. The city has suffered sporadic attacks since Ukrainian forces regained territory and pushed back Russian troops earlier this month. As fighting continues, the U.S. has promised to support Ukraine's investigations into alleged war crimes by Russian forces. I think one of the challenges is that there are a lot of cases. And how do you prioritize and order them and do them in the midst of a country in war? Yeah, there are a lot of challenges, but that won't deter us. A war that's not expected to end anytime soon. Military experts say both sides face a prolonged war of attrition in the east of Ukraine in the coming months. A papa stavili v Kyivě. Možná, že se bude pojevat. Nechci tak. Já tu. Nějakou zbroju my neskládáme. There's nothing less happening than major war crime. Але Україна поверне все своє, все, і це обов'язково, і це лише питання часу, і кожного дня цей час, час звільнення, він скорочується.